Welcome back and alive now from Fox. I'm Austin Westfall. Let's get to the latest on the Israel Hamas war. And for that, we turn to Dr. Alone Burstein of uh, UCI, visiting assistant professor and Israel Institute fellow. Alone, always good to see you. There is a lot to get to. It's been a busy few days. There is a lot of speculation out there right now about the possibility of Iran striking Israel directly following the killings of Iranian generals in Syria earlier this month. But as Trey Yingst says, uh, Israel's I should say, as Trey Ings says, it's impossible to know what Iran has planned, if anything at all. Israel's foreign minister, meanwhile, is threatening that this, that his country's forces would strike Iran directly if the Islamic Republic launched an attack from its territory against Israel. Uh, what strikes me about all of this is the word directly alone. Pretty much all of the fighting we've seen since October 7th has been through Iranian proxies. You're a history guy. Um, have Israel and Iran ever had any type of direct combat, or has it always primarily been through the proxies? First of all, Austin, always good to see you. Um, and you're absolutely right. This, if this would escalate to a direct confrontation between the countries, this would be a first. Iran, since the revolution in 1979, has invested monumental amounts of funding, research, technology, anything you want to develop these proxies in the Middle East. And we're seeing how it's paying off for them, you know, many years later. However, throughout all of their, you know, big talk rhetoric and the money that they give and the weapons that they give, the country itself has never gone to war with Israel. There have been a couple of times where it came fairly close. There was one time last year where a couple of missiles were launched by from Syria and it was speculated that it was actually Iran launching them themselves. But otherwise, the country has always employed its proxies. In turn, Israel has never carried out direct strikes in Iran either. Israel has retaliated against things that Iranian proxies do, even when it's very clear that it is Iran, even when Iran almost takes responsibility for it. Israel has always retaliated against Iranian proxies. And even when Israel's carried out, the Mossad is carrying out, carried out assassinations in Iran, it's almost never taken responsibility for it. So the way the region is right now gearing up for war, if that does break out, it will be a first, and we're seeing how big it is. We're seeing that the Iranian foreign minister tonight reportedly spoke with the foreign ministers of Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the UAE, Iraq. The United States has said that they will participate if Israel has to retaliate in Iran, that they will, they do not take it out of the question, that they will also participate. We're seeing how big this is. Is it going to happen or is it not going to happen? A lot of the rhetoric that Iran is using is implying that it is going to happen. The Supreme Leader, Ali Khamenei, said today that the attack that Israel carried out in Damascus on April 1st that killed right, Mohammad Raza Zahedi um, was an attack on the, on the Iranian consulate and that that constitutes an attack on Iranian soil and therefore Israel already carried out the first strike. So the rhetoric does show that that's probably what they're going to do. I will say that alongside the rhetoric, again, Iran has never wanted a direct confrontation. So much so, even with this current war, it has not wanted a direct confrontation even between Israel and Hezbollah. Even with its main proxy, it has not let, oh, it's not like loosened all the restraints and let war break out. So there's a lot of rhetoric. It'll be very surprising if Iran does say, okay, all bets are off, it's time to launch this all out war. Uh, on the one hand, the other hand, Iran sort of needs to save face. The attack on its consulate and the assassination of this top general is a big blow for Iran. So they do need to show their people and mostly their militias who they're sending out to fight. They need to show what well, we're also prepared to fight, but they need to do something. Remains to be seen how they try to do that while maybe not escalating to an all-out war. Remains to be seen. Does Iran have a history of promising to attack Israel and then simply doing nothing? It has a history of always making threats that the future is coming. You know, Iran is run by, by, by religious authority. Religious authorities are very good at saying, you know, someday retribution will come. So Iran has said, right, that the Israeli cancer is going to be cut out of the Middle East. Israel's days are numbered. Israel's going to pay for its crime. The Republic is going to make it pay for its crime. They have a long history of saying that they're going to do. I will say what's different about the current situation compared to this long history is one, we are in the midst already of an all-out regional war. We are in the midst of Israel being attacked and attacking, as you said, the Iranian proxies across from Lebanon to Syria to Iraq to Yemen to Gaza. So we're in the midst of escalations already. And the second thing is this attack that was carried out in the consulate, even though Israel did not admit that it did it, it's very obvious that that was an Israeli attack. The attack that was carried out in the consulate is already a game changer. That is already Israel escalating. 
an attack on the consulate by international law also would constitute an attack on the country itself. The fact that the attack was carried out in Damascus, that it was carried out against, you know, these quote-unquote advisors who are clearly involved in promoting terrorism, but they're not combatants themselves. So the, the escalation sort of, the spark was already there in Israel's initial attack, sort of to say that the rules of the game have changed and we're now in a different position. It remains to be seen if Iran sort of almost like takes the bait and says, okay, so we are in all-out war now, or if it tries to still retaliate, but not go into this all-out explosion, which would occur if it would attack directly. There's a lot to watch. There's a lot to be seen, as you say. Uh, we will be following the situation with Iran closely. I do want to move on to some of the news of the day, though. Three sons of Hamas leader Ismail Haneya were killed in an Israeli strike in the Gaza Strip on Wednesday. Uh, that's according to the Palestinian Islamist group and Haneya's family. Uh, the Israeli military confirmed carrying out this attack alone, describing that the three sons as uh, the three sons were operatives in the Hamas armed wing. There were also some of his grandchildren killed in this strike as well. Let's give a little more context to this situation. Uh, Hania's family is obviously in Gaza, or at least some of them are in Gaza at least, but he himself is not, correct? Yeah, Ismail Haniya um, has a long history in the Hamas leadership. He was actually the Hamas prime minister when Hamas won the elections. The last time there were elections in the Palestinian Authority in 2006, he became the prime minister. And he, since then, rose in the ranks also of the different leadership apparatuses of Hamas. And he was the internal leader, right? We have the divided leadership. He was the internal leader of Hamas until 2017, when really what happened is it was a leadership cha change. He got elected to lead the political bureau, which historically really means he's the, he's the ultimate leader of Hamas. And that leader historically has always lived outside of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank for security purposes. Because as they're engaged in the fighting, Hamas wanted its leadership to be far away. So because of that, symbolically, but also for practical reasons, he left the Gaza Strip. He was in the Gaza Strip until 2017, he left. Instead of him, who was appointed the leader in the Gaza Strip, is the name we know, Yahya Sinwar the current leader of Hamas in the Gaza Strip. That's how they both became the leaders. Yahya Sinwar in the Gaza Strip, Ismail Haniya, the ultimate leader, so to speak, who is in Qatar. He used to be, they used to be in Syria, but after the Syrian civil war broke out, Hamas sided with the rebels, and thus they were kicked out of Syria and ended up in Qatar. Now, Haniya has come under a lot of criticism because leaders like him and Khalid Mashal, these are the known figures of Hamas, they live lavish lives. In Qatar, they live in seven-star hotels. Their fortunes together is estimated at some, you know, over five billion dollars, according to some different reports. And you know, this stands in sharp contrast to what is to the situation of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, which is brought on, among others, as a result of Hamas's activity. So there's a lot of criticism about this external leadership. His, some of his family lives with him. Some of the family remained back in the Gaza Strip when his sons were assassinated today. One of the first things he said, you know, he saw the opportunity to say, see, my family is suffering too. See, it's the fact that I'm living this lavish life as an external leader does not mean that my family is not suffering. In fact, the exact quote that he said is, the blood of my family is no different than the blood of any Palestinian who is spilled in the Gaza Strip. This is no different than any other IDF attack. So it is true that, that you know, this is obviously a strike against him personally, and obviously he's going to feel it that some of his grandchildren were killed. But it's also, he's using it as a way to try to show, okay, but you see, even though I lived this lavish life in Qatar, and really is a lavish life, some of the pictures that you see coming out from their gold laden hotels, I'm still like one of the people fighting in the Gaza Strip, which of course he's not. Let's talk a little bit more about Gaza, Han Yunus to be specific. Here's some video that was taken this week. Han Yunus residents returned to their communities on Monday to salvage what they could from the destruction. This comes after the IDF withdrew from the area the day before. Uh, alone, do we know why the IDF left Han Yunus? There's a lot of different reports. We don't have an official answer. Um, the, some of the, uh, but I'll, I'll say that the common denominator among the reports is that the reason is this holdup in the invasion of Rafa. The IDF invaded Han Yunus already four months ago. It made Han Yunus in December. And Han Yunus is one of the strongest strongest strongholds believe me, of, um, of Hamas had four battalions there and it was expected that the fighting would take a long time the fighting had pretty much played itself out the IDF had subdued most of the battalions already a month ago with that 
IDF forces in the city become much more sitting ducks. They're not there with a specific purpose, so they're just holding territory, which allows them to be attacked here and there without a lot of purpose. Seemingly, what the IDF was expecting is, okay, and now they'll be given the order by Israel political establishment to continue the invasion to, to, to Rafah. That did not happen. That did not happen because of a lot of the political escalation that has occurred and the fact that Israel has been pretty much forbade by the United States to carry out that invasion before a lot of things will happen. And the IDF was stalling. It was stalling. It was carrying out different operations in El Amal. It was carrying out operations in El Karara. This is in the, in the outskirts, in the western parts of the city, in the eastern parts of the city. Eventually, I think they just decided to withdraw, let the troops regroup before going back in. The IDF has been repeating again and again that this is not an end to the fighting. That as far as they're concerned, they haven't withdrawn from the Gaza Strip. They simply ran out of what they were doing here and, and thus withdrew. I will say that already, though, there's there's criticism that is being raised by IDF officers that are saying that what is happening in Han Yunis is very similar to what happened in the, in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip. Without the political establishment in Israel having any mechanism to replace Hamas, Hamas governing positions. What is happening is along with the civilians that have returned to Han Yunis, Hamas is returning to Han Yunis. We already know that there's Hamas police officers who are starting to take up their positions again, who are starting to do anything from running sanitation to clearing rubble to being police officers because there's no other governing apparatus. And in the IDF, there's a lot of frustration that is being that, that is starting to surface saying, the IDF goes in, succeeds in the mission, Hamas battalions are destroyed, but because there's no plan for what happens next in the Gaza Strip, the IDF pulls out and Hamas is returning. So it remains to be seen if the IDF is going to end up returning to Han soon. That could be the case. Obviously, all this destruction that we're looking at on the screen right now was done in the name of destroying Hamas. That's what we've been hearing from the IDF ever since October. But are there any high-level conversations that you're picking up on about where these civilians go long term obviously i mean we're, we're looking at these pictures this is no condition for people to live in there's a lot of conversations there does not appear to be a plan as long as the war is going on um the idf is focused more on temporary situations when it comes to palestinians there's a report that in preparing for evacuating the over a million civilians from rafah the idf has begun purchasing some 40,000 large-scale tents that are, that are going to be used to maybe move civilians and house them in different places. But there's no permanent solution that's being developed. There are solutions that are being voiced by the United States. They're not solutions, but I'll say plans that are being voiced by the United States, the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, who have talked about what is really going to be needed eventually is money, number one, obviously, and number two, heavy industrial equipment, right? Most of the equipment that would be used to even just, just remove the rubble, I mean, you can see the pictures, remove the rubble from the streets in order to start rebuilding neighborhoods. For that, you need vast industrial equipment. Israel and the IDF, I will say, you could really understand their point of view, are saying yes, but heavy industrial equipment in the Gaza Strip has been used to build tunnels, has been used for weaponry. So Israel and the IDF are not allowing any industrial equipment to operate in the Gaza Strip right now, and it would be far-fetched to think that they're just going to allow Palestinian companies or, or aid agencies to start rebuilding later. So there's going to have to be some mechanism of coordination between Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, maybe Qatar, the United States. All of them are saying they're developing plans for removing rubble and rebuilding, but it's not going to work unless the IDF actually feels that someone is making sure this is not being used for terror activity. That part has not been solved yet how you bridge those two sides. And we, of course, are still waiting for some sort of extended ground incursion from the IDF into Rafah. That's something that we've been talking about for months now. There is one more thing I want to hit before we go alone. Hamas has told negotiators that it does not have 40 Israeli hostages that it can release as part of a temporary ceasefire deal with Israel, a source familiar with the talks confirmed to the Hill. So Israel says 133 hostages total have yet to be released, 133, yet Hamas says that they don't have 40 living hostages. It's been common knowledge that a number of hostages, sadly, are not alive, but did we know that the number of living doesn't even reach 40? And of course, it's also worth asking alone, can we even put any real stock in that number of 40? Because it's from a terrorist organization. 
All very good questions. So I'll just say some uh, some numbers. There are 133 hostages that remain. Of those, the IDF has confirmed that between 35 and 36 are dead, and different intelligence agencies have suggested that it is possible that there are another 20 who are dead. But that's in terms of the estimates of who is dead and who is alive. I will say that I read Hamas's message a little bit different, and then I'll talk about if it's believable or not. I read Hamas's message as relating to the first phase of the deal, because right now what's being negotiated in the first phase of the deal is releasing everyone who Hamas does not consider soldiers of military age. That means males who are under 65. With that, that is how they came up with the number of 40. That means women, elderly, people who are injured, and Israel has been pressuring that IDF female soldiers also be included, and that's a bit of a sticking point because Hamas is saying they're not releasing fighters, and as far as I can turn anyone under 65 who's a male can be a fighter, while well, IDF female soldiers, where do they fall? Israel's insisting that they be included in the first phase that is considered, again, not people who cannot be combatants as far as Hamas is concerned. That is who they're relating to. When they say that they don't have 40 Israeli hostages to be released, they are saying that though those who fit that category, specifically, they don't have 40 live hostages. To some extent, I'll say, regrettably, that may make sense, because there were a total of between 40 or 42 who, was, who fit this category, so it is possible that some of them have been killed. It is also possible that some of them are held by other organizations. We know that the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, the Popular Front of the Liberation of Palestine, we know that they also were holding hostages. It is possible that Hamas is trying to imply that they're not holding them, it's other organizations. It is also, of course, possible that Hamas is lying, that they simply don't want to give out away their cards and say how many they have. I will say that it would not necessarily be in their interest to say that they're lying. Live hostages are, are a lot more valuable than dead hostages. Hamas has an interest in keeping hostages alive because that is the biggest bargaining chip that they have to stop the war, to stop the fighting. So I would argue that if they did have 40 live hostages, they would probably have no problem using them. It is possible that they only want to return, let's say, 30, and hold on to another 10, then say, oh, we found them. So obviously it's possible. I'm not saying that we can take them at their word, but there are circumstances in which it is also possible that some of these are dead or not in Hamas's possession, and that is what they're implying. But again, right now, Hamas has not even given its answer to if they agree to the deal. This is all still preliminary. Israel's demanding that Hamas say how many live hostages they have, this is just Hamas's answer that they said, we're not sure we can, we can supply even that list. So we're still a long way away from a deal. All right, so much to follow alone. We will, of course, keep in touch with you. We will talk with you shortly. We always look forward to your daily YouTube uploads as well. Take care.